Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in Northern Virginia, where we are at Aerojet Rocketdyne's offices to talk to uh, Tom Martin, who is the Senior Manager for Business Development for uh, Government and Commercial Launch. Correct. Tom, thanks for uh, talking to us. Thanks for having me. Uh, first, you guys had a couple of announcements this week, so I want to take first on the AR-1. That's a new rocket engine you guys are de uh, developing. It's in the 500,000-pound uh, class, and you guys had some news. Tell us what you guys did. So down at Stennis Space Center, we had uh, uh, what we're calling a stage combustion test where we actually couple the pre-burner with the main injector uh, and, and had a successful hot fire test. Um, it's really important that we, we get this kind of data. We're heading into uh, critical design on the engine system. So this data is going to feed into that design process, make sure we've got the right flight design as we move forward into uh, engine development. Um, I am, uh, for those people who know me, uh, I am a space geek uh, among my other attributes, and I'm also a rocket engine geek, so the fact that I'm actually talking to a rocket uh, engine engineer is something that's very exciting. Uh, you went to Purdue, so you know your way around rockets, and that's what your career has been. Why is the AR-1 such an important program? Uh, really, it's geared to, re to end our reliance on the Russian RD-180. It's an engine, that, a very good engine, but one we've been dependent on for a long time. Uh, so AR-1 is really focused at, at being that replacement and ultimately we think being an engine that the space launch community in the U.S. can leverage for, for a long time to come. The RD-180 continues the heritage of the very unique Russian architecture that's gone to some of the engines to be able to get that kind of power out of them. How, what are some of the features that the AR-1 has that differentiates it uh, from other engines and, and gives it that little bit of a boost when it comes to power? Well, it's, it's the RD-180 and the AR-1 are both what we call stage combustion engines, and they run on fuel uh, called kerosene, which I'm sure most people have heard of kerosene. Um, so it's that unique... And, and liquid oxygen is the oxidizer and, for the it, oxidizer. going all the way back to the Saturn, and the Russians still use the same thing on the Soyuz, Absolutely. for example. Absolutely. In fact, the Atlas V is, is a kerosene-fueled um, booster. Um, so it's really the stage combustion aspect that, that is unique. Uh, we've, we've developed a lot of kerosene gas generator cycle engines. We have not in the U.S. yet fully developed a stage combustion kerosene engine, so that's what the AR-1 uh, represents. And that, that stage combustion cycle is, is unique because it's very, very fuel efficient. If, if we talk specific impulse or, or kind of miles per gallon, it's much more fuel efficient than a gas generator cycle engine, which is typically what the U.S. has used for, for, for booster engines. And, uh, any, and since I get excited when you talk about specific impulse, tell us you know, what kind of numbers you guys are getting and why those numbers are important. Well, I'm not going to give you specific numbers, but they are, you know, the intent was to, to replicate broadly the performance of the RD-180. We're not creating a replica, so there are differences in the performance, we're, we're higher thrust, et cetera. The idea was to give the vehicle similar performance um, as an RD-180. Um, so, you know, if you understand the RD-180, you can get a, get a sense for the AR-1. Um, what, uh, how soon before this air engine is going to be flight ready? Uh, we intend to have it qualified by 2019, where we have an agreement with the United States Air Force to, to develop the engine and have it qualified for 2019. So that's pretty much the Air One team's uh, singular focus right now. How, how does it feel as a rocket engineer to, you know, a couple of years ago, if you had talked to people about launch vehicles, I mean, it was, you know, the ULA deal went together. I mean, it was sort of seen as like, oh, you know, one company is perfectly fine. And now you've got you know, the SpaceX guys obviously, you know, churning out Merlins as fast as they possibly can because they're, they're clustering. You guys are involved in its development. Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos and his team are, are working on, on, on that. It's just an absolutely positively exciting time to be in the rocket engine business, isn't it? It is a very exciting time to be in the rocket business. Um, but I think it's important that we remember, you know, why we do this. And, and that's, and, and you've been hearing it, I think, a lot from, um, the government is the importance, the increasing importance that the um, space plays in our national defense and our national security. So th that's kind of our primary focus, um, and, and we don't want to lose sight of that. So we think, you know, the commercial aspect that, that, that appears to be growing is very interesting, um, but our first priority is making sure that we can get our national security assets, um, as well as our scientific payloads from NASA, et cetera, uh, on orbit. And then we look to the commercial market as kind of that, that growth area. Um, but, but with AR-1, you know, one of our main focuses is, is cost, but making sure that, that we have the mission assurance and the mission success that, that our national security demands. So that's kind of maybe a little unique perspective with respect to Aerojet Rocketdyne versus the, the Blues and the SpaceX's. And we think that's one of the key 
things we bring is that that experience. You know, we're building and flying rocket engines today that are putting critical payloads up in orbit, and the government has the confidence in us. You guys are also uh, changing how you're manufacturing this new engine. Talk to us a little bit about some of the technology and, and processes you're using for that. Right. So, so we're actually taking kind of a conservative approach. We're using the technologies we've demonstrated in flight, but where we see a real advantage from a cost or a performance, we're, we're investing in new technology. Additive manufacturing, uh, selective laser melting in particular, is one technology we're bringing to bear. I mentioned it earlier um, with respect to the F1 gas generator, the AM uh, gas generator that we fired. That was using our additively manufactured technology. So that's one piece. Uh, we have a proprietary alloy. Um, called Mondaloy is actually named after the, the two developers of it. Um, it's what's called um, burn resistant in oxygen environments. So in an oxygen rich um, engine like AR1, uh, we don't need to apply coatings that, that the Russians do and other, other potential engines do. We can use that base metal. So it's, it's more cost effective and more reliable because we don't have to worry about the coatings coming off. So that's another key technology that, that we're infusing into AR1. We've been working on it um, for a very long time. Now we're really seeing the fruits of that labor in terms of getting it into an engine um, that will, will serve a use. And, and what are the primary constituent metals that are going into this new alloy? Without exact precise combinations, because I could already see you blanching, going, I would like something very specific, 22 nickel alloy. Exactly, right. <laughs> it's, it's a nickel base, it's a, it's a high strength nickel based alloy. Um, you know, s similar to a lot, a lot of the nickel-based alloys we use in the rocket engines, like 718, okay. 625. Uh, but it, it does have special formulation that makes it uh, more resistant to uh, burning. I, a lot of people don't know that, that in an oxygen-rich environment, even metal will literally be a fuel. So right. we, we've learned the hard way on a lot of engine tests that if you have what's called a LOX fire, um, there's no hardware left to inspect. It's pretty, yeah. it's pretty yeah. amazing. So it's, it's, it's a key technology for an oxygen-rich um, engine like AR-1. Well, and, and so folks will tell, like, this is also part of the cooling and the pipes. So you're preheating, but you're also cooling, uh, cooling the engine so it doesn't, you know, melt. Um, from an investment standpoint, I have to ask you this because I know that you guys all jealously guard how much you guys are independently spending on this. But can you give us a sort of a bread box size figure on how much you guys have been investing in your own money uh, on AR1? Obviously, the focus uh, certainly for the last administration was to prompt companies to put some more skin in the game to make that investment and bring a product to, to, to the government. How much have you guys invested out of your own money to develop this uh, technologies? So, so going back to kind of where did the program really start, if, if you go back to, to the entire history of the technology that's going into AR1, it's, it's on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, from the program start in 2014, you know, it's on the, the order of tens of millions on the high side of, of that. The, the OTA, the Other Transaction Authority Agreement with the government, requires that we invest uh, at least one-third of the total cost to develop the uh, the engine. Uh, they put in 536 uh, million, so you can you can do the math on what it's going to take on our side to, to get to, to the end. How exciting was that test uh, as, a, as a rocket engineer to see um, you guys hot-firing it for the first time? Uh, anytime we get to see smoke and fire, it's it's awesome. Um, you, you know, and you, noise. Well, and, and you, you gotta you gotta really be at the facility and see the hardware to understand the amount of power that these these machines are generating. Um, you know, the the facility, this giant facility, is built just to try and pretend like it's parts of the engine. Um, so yeah, it's it's as a as a rocket engineer, it's it's amazing to see that. That's what we live for, quite frankly. You know, and we're we're in this we're in the period right now in the design uh, the development where it's a lot of design work. So you don't necessarily always get that reminder of what you're working on. So when we we run these types of tests, it's really invigorating to the team to say, okay, this is where we're headed. This is why we're doing it. You guys also should set up an art gallery because I think all the parts that go into rocket engines actually look like sculptural elements. So you guys, like, you know, if you have any discarded parts, you guys could be selling those as modern art pieces and I'm sure set up quite a quite a bespoke little gallery. A absolutely, as long as we don't violate any of our uh, ITAR rules. <laughs> yeah. Company proprietary ones. But otherwise, we'll put them up on eBay and, and you're good to go. Uh, just make sure you let me know before you do that. Um, I want to go to your facilities uh, okay. question. You guys are obviously uh, building a new facility facility in Huntsville. Tell us a little bit about uh, about the facility and what you guys are trying to accomplish. Right. So we announced AR1 production in uh, the Huntsville area. 
Um, so that's obviously contingent on whether, you know, the, the future of the program. But the idea is the, the engines would be built um, uh, in Huntsville, and then we would send them down to Stennis. They'd have additional work done on them, uh, tested at the, that the, that the big test stands down at Stennis, which, you know, why, that's why Stennis is there. Then the engines go through additional prep uh, and then are ultimately delivered to the customer to, to be strapped on the vehicle. Let's take a moment now and walk us through the contours of this competition, because there are a couple of companies that are in public-private partnerships with the Air Force in order to be able to develop a new rocket engine, and you are one of those guys who's doing it. You're like them, but you're also different. Bring us up to speed on on how the government is going about developing a new rocket engine. Okay. So, so depending on how you want to look at it, we've been working on AR-1 for a long time. If you look at some of the legacy programs that were focused on kerosene stage combustion, the RS-84 with NASA, uh, the hydrocarbon boost program, which is ongoing, um, and all the way back to the space shuttle main engine development, which was the first stage combustion engine. We've been working on the technology for a long time. Uh, we really started the, the AR-1 program in earnest back in 2014. Um, after you know the invasion of Crimea, it was it was obvious that that there was now some political will to to end our reliance on RD-180. So we started the program on company funds back in 2014 uh, with ULA. Um, then you saw in the NDAA for 15, Congress directing the Air Force to to, to go um, get off the the Russian engine. Um, and eventually that, that turned into the Air Force doing what they called the Rocket Propulsion System, uh, OTA, Other Transaction Authority, which was develop, w was meant to develop the rocket technology required to, to get off the RD-180. And so there were four winners. Aerojet Rocketdyne w w had the largest award. Uh, SpaceX, ULA, and Orbital ATK um, also won. Um, so that's what the engine is being developed on. We're through that agreement with the Air Force to get qualified, that, that engine qualified by 2019. Um, it, right now, it's, it's with the Air Force and, and, and Congress and all the other stakeholders to determine uh, exactly how they want to proceed with respect to the overall launch vehicle development. And there would be a down select, presumably, among all of these engines. Uh, we're, we're really looking at it. It's not a. It's not really about it. the engine. Ultimately, it's about the launch capability. So we're developing AR1 on our agreement, and we believe that you stick it on the right vehicle, and and it's going to be the right solution. Uh, like I said, the Air Force is still trying to, to determine exactly how it wants to move forward on the launch vehicle development. There's, you know, we have existing launch capabilities that could be leveraged to going as far as as completely new vehicle development. I think. You know, the Air Force is, is trying to determine, and ULA is trying to determine the right path. Uh, as a space geek, I'm going to change gears now. Awesome. Um, you <laughs> yeah, it's about time we stop talking about that stuff. Let's talk about the real stuff. Um, no, thank you very much for that, for bringing us up to speed on it. Um, now, anybody who knows about rocket engines is going to look at this behind you and could be mistaken for thinking that this is an F-1, obviously one of the five engines that would be in the first stage of a Saturn V rocket. Right. But it's not, is it, Tom? No, I believe it was actually uh, the Aerojet um, M1 engine, which was developed in this, er, was being developed in a similar time frame. It was a roughly million pound thrust liquid hydrogen, uh, liquid oxygen rocket. Um, I'm not. They they didn't get to full engine testing as many rocket programs do, but they made significant progress. And obviously, uh, if you can see, it was a very large engine. Oh. Yep. How, how, I mean, how cool is that, uh, uh, basically? I, basically, everything about this is cool, from, from the technology to, to the, the old school painting. Love it all. Uh, yeah, a absolutely. That is, that is a use of turquoise that you just don't see in no, this, no. In this day, day and age. Uh, let me ask you, though, you were also involved in a really, really cool project, because a couple of years ago, the most powerful American launch vehicle engine was the F-1 in the million and a half pound uh, thrust, thrust range. Um, you know, obviously used throughout the, the Saturn program, Saturn V program, throughout the Apollo program. You launched Skylab as well. Um, and you were on a project to map or to study that engine to see whether or not it could be put back into production, the F-1B program. Tell us a little bit about what it was like as a rocket engineer to immerse yourself in that. And what are some of the things you, you learned that you said, man, you know, these guys were working with slide rules and some very ancient computer mm -hmm. technology. I love that, uh, that exhibit in the Air and Space Museum that Sergei Korolev and Werner von Braun were using the exact same model of slide rule as, as rocket engineers. Tell us a little bit about you know, what that process was like. 
Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. It's not the first time that, that I've gone back and looked at the, the extensive history that, that Aerojet Rocketdyne has in terms of developing engines. But yeah, that program was to kind of resurrect the F-1, uh, modernize it. But but to start, we had to understand all, all of the work that had been done in the 1960s. So it was reading extensive test reports. It was watching uh, documentaries. It, at the time, it was really cool. Um, they actually had uh, a Disney narrator do the videos. Uh, so awesome. very, yeah, I guess at the time, Warner Von Braun and, and Walt Disney were very close, so they had a lot of uh, uh, cooperative stuff going on there. So our videos were actually made, uh, the NASA videos were made with the help of Walt Disney. So it was awesome seeing all of the work that they'd done, the amount of testing that was going on, uh, the amount of learning that was going on. Um, and, and you do hear those interesting stories, you know, there's what you read in the reports, but we had we had the advantage of, of what we call the graybeards, some of the folks that were actually working those programs in the 1960s they came back and and gave us their stories and you hear things about oh yeah don't listen to the report we actually just machined this thing differently and it worked and we don't know why but hey we got to the moon so it, it is fascinating that the the historical side and then also seeing the the engineering challenges that they were solving at that time and that we're we're, we're living our company is living off of that experience base so we bring that to all the products uh, that we develop today. Um, and it's not just been the F1, you know, working the J2X. I, I was back extensively researching mm -hmm. the J2 program. Right, Amazing right. things they do. They had it. They had an in-flight failure on uh, J2. And as they did back in the 60s, they put an engine on the test stand. They, they basically set the engine on fire like they thought it was. Uh, on the uh, on the actual flight and wait, waited to see what was happening. So it was it was very different back then. The, you know the way they did a test fail fix type of approach versus we're much more analysis and design driven today. What was the the thing that um, amazed you about that generation of engines and particularly the F1? Because if you think about it, nobody had produced. You know the Russians were clustering for a reason. We were going to these five gigantic you know, consuming three tons of fuel, you know, a second right. uh, through a turbo, I mean, you know, and then you got to drive the turbo pump, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so, I mean, it, it's just like you look at some of these challenges, it's just extraordinary. Oh, yeah, what, what they were doing at the time, what was amazing, and you could see the amount of resources that were brought to bear to make it happen, right? I mean, it was really all about the manpower that, that they could bring at the time and the amount of, basically the amount of testing that they could do to, to demonstrate this, because you, 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 you simply can't, analyze, particularly you couldn't in the 60s, but but even today it's difficult to fully analyze all of the combustion physics and, and, and all of the stresses and everything that was going on. So they were, you know, just testing a whole lot and breaking things a whole lot and eventually got it to work. Um, you know, we, we did a cool thing on, on, on the F-1B program. We took one of the gas generators, which is what you just mentioned, with the, that huge piece of combustion device that, that drove the turbo pump, and we made it additively manufactured version of it. So we literally printed a, a near replica. We had to make some modifications, mm -hmm. um, and then we hot-fired it down at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, so it was, it was an interesting, you know, bringing the heritage forward and the brand-new technology, um, and then seeing it hot-fire tested down at Marshall, this e enormous flame. That was, that was the cool <laughs> part. Yeah, that's really, at the end of the day, what it's all about is, is, is the, you know, and, and the poor people of Huntsville have broken so much China over the decades whenever one of those tests, you know, it was like when you, the F1 was going off, especially, you know, folks oh, yeah. were. Yeah, I go, you can go onto YouTube and, and, and um, you can see the uh, Saturn V first stage test, the development test that they did um, at Marshall. Uh, yeah, the stories are they. You know, if it was a cloudy day, they were breaking windows uh, of, of the surrounding homes when they were testing. So that's why they eventually decided to move down to Stennis. They created a buffer zone down there in the swamp, uh, so that they, you know, wouldn't um, madden the locals too much. <laughs> I would, I would actually uh, love that, and I regret never having heard that engine. One last question: What's your favorite space book? What's your favorite space movie? Space book. You can go engineering on us if you want to, like, you know, the Diaries of Werner von Braun. I mean, that's that's cool. Well, there, there's a classic book on rocket propulsion, uh, actually by a guy who worked at, at Rocketdyne. I'd recommend picking that up. It's kind of the Bible of rocket propulsion. I think it's actually called Rocket Propulsion. Elements. Yeah. Elements of Rocket Propulsion, and the author is? Oh, I see. Oh, that's all right. That's okay. <laughs> and Space Movie. So that that's a tough one because I, I literally love all of them. I would say recently I've been watching The Expanse on sci-fi. Mm, okay. Highly recommended. It. it takes place in, I don't know, 200 years from the future 
where we've colonized Mars, we're out on the asteroid belt. Um, so it's it's a very cool sci-fi show that, that uh, hmm. is in its second season. Not that I work for Sci-Fi Channel or anything, <laughs> but highly recommended. Check your local listings. Um, by the way, there's a, a British cat who wants to build a 1,000-foot-long um, or so enterprise, a starship enterprise, of the same configuration with artificial gravity in the saucer, um, well, that, see, for as I, an interplanetary spaceship. Well, I would first ask, which version of Enterprise? Um, I see, that's, that's key to me, because I'm, I'm actually a next generation guy. Really? Yeah. I'm an original series guy. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there is such a classic look to the original Enterprise. The new one just looks clunky. I, I think, so you, you got the old one, and then the new, new, new one, but then yes. you have next generation. I think that's... That's the nicest one. Oh, you mean you mean with a little bit Captain, of a more of a sp- Captain Picard. Oh no, God, that's big and hulky to me. No, I love it. The the new one is a little too swoopy. The, the nineteen six stylized. Right? It's too stylized. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a little too wasp wasted and things like that, which you just don't need. And the engineering spaces look a little bit like a fertilizer factory. But but this is how I know I'm a true rocket engineer is because I feel it, it's kind of cool to be a Star Trek fan right now, but not, it's still not cool to be a Next Generation fan. Tom, thank you very much for that. And also, please keep us posted on your reading list and what we should be watching as people who are space and aerospace geeks. Absolutely. Will do. 